The Celts were an ancient warrior people who considered warfare to be an essential activity in their lives. Many tribes had feuds and disputes among themselves. Often, there were bloody battles to decide who was right or wrong. Some of these conflicts had such ancient origins that tribes often warred over things that had happened many years ago. These combative and impetuous traits of the Celts were their greatest strength, but unfortunately for them, it was also their greatest weakness. The Celts did not usually make written records about their own history. Much of what we know about them comes from Greek and Roman accounts. One of the main accounts comes from the famous Roman general Julius Caesar. He, around 50 BC, compiled his military experiences in a diary after seven campaigns in Gaul. The diary written by Caesar was titled Commentarii de Bello Gallico, which can be translated as Commentaries on the Gallic War and was written in Latin. Julius Caesar wanted to annex the territories of Gaul, bringing them under Roman rule. By doing so, he would raise his own social status in Rome. However, Gaul was a huge and wild territory, without roads or bridges, full of hostile Celtic tribes. Many Romans knew it as Gallia Comata, or Long-Haired Gaul. Among the main tribes were the Boai, Eduai, Helvetians, Arverni, Belgians, and many others. It was a network of several tribes, composed of brutal warriors. The Romans were always quite attentive to the military and political weaknesses of other peoples. Caesar was able to take advantage of this instability among the tribes and began his campaign by allying himself with the Edui tribe. The Edui lived in the Burgundy region of present-day France and felt threatened by the Helvetian and Averni tribes. The Helvetians, along with the tribe of the Boii and Tulingi, had begun a large migration, leaving Switzerland and attacking villages that belonged to the Edui. When Caesar made his legions available to help the Helvetians, the leaders of the Edui, named Mahorbin, was very pleased and accepted Roman help without much difficulty. The battle that followed became known as the Battle of Bibracte. Even though the Romans were outnumbered, their tactical superiority and discipline formations were able to repel the Celts, who attacked with a merciless fury. Eventually, the Roman army, which was on higher ground, was able to overpower the Celts. With their cavalry surrounding the battle, they managed to attack the rear of the Celts, where the supplies were, forcing them to surrender. After the battle, many Celts were spared and freed, on the condition that they returned to their lands near the Rhine River, where they were to defend the borders against invaders from the Germanic tribes. Sometime later, Caesar and his legions helped repel the Germans. In this way, the Romans got what they wanted, a clear path into Gaul territory. Morbane, the king of the Aedui, added 3,000 Celtic horsemen to the Roman army, increasing the strength and confidence of Julius Caesar's legions. Many battles were fought over the next six years. Some tribes followed the example of the Adui, allying themselves with the Roman army. These tribes were always seduced with promises of riches and trade with Rome. At the same time, they took the opportunity to finish off enemy tribes and settle old blood feuds. Despite their courage in battle, the Celts had no disciplined armies. Their warriors fought individually, relying on strength, agility, and savagery to attack Roman formations. As this approach seemed unsuccessful, they began to use guerrilla tactics, attacking the legions by surprise, during the march or at night. Still, Rome's advance was relentless. The kings of the remaining tribes needed some time to realize what was happening. Roman promises quickly turned into threats. The Celts were caught in a spiderweb by their own ambitions. Around 53 BC, the Celtic Belgians of the Eburonian tribe revolted against the demands of Rome, which needed to feed its legions, and for that, it wanted the Eburonian crops. The king of the Eburones was called Ambiorix. He incited his warriors to take up arms against their oppressors, forming the so-called Ambiorix Revolt. To contain this revolt, Caesar sent the commanders Quintus Titerius Sabinus and Lucius Arunculius Cota commanding the 14th Twin Legion and also a detachment of five cohorts, totaling approximately 7,500 men. But to the surprise of the Romans, the Celtic Belgians had recruited a staggering number of warriors. It is not known for sure how many there were, but it is estimated that there were four Celts for every Roman soldier or even more. 
the Romans were attacked by surprise during their march in a region known as Atuatuca. Ambiorix's forces came from two different directions. The result was a massacre. Almost all the Roman soldiers were killed, including two commanders sent by Caesar. This event was known as the Massacre at Atuatuca. The survivors reported the terror they witnessed and Julius Caesar wrote in his diary, of all the Gauls, the Belgians are the bravest. The revolt came to an end when Caesar and his 50,000 soldiers entered the scene. Virtually all the Celtic Belgian tribes were massacred and their villages and crops were looted and burned. And Burex and some of his men managed to cross the Rhine River and escape towards Germania, but were never seen again. Ambiorix's revolt aroused a kind of nationalistic feeling among the Celts. Many tribes began to put their differences aside to unite against Roman oppression. Much of this new resistance was organized by the Druids. The union of the tribes in Gaul had always been something feared by the Romans, but it was finally happening. A young prince took on the responsibility of fighting for the freedom of his people. Vercingetorix was a prince of the son of Celtillus, the king of the Averni. His name means the chief of the great warriors. The Averni were one of the richest and most developed Celtic tribes. Much of this wealth came from their alliance with Rome. Vercingetorix himself served in Caesar's army, where he learned to speak Latin and learned Roman battle tactics. After his father's death, Vercingetorix was expelled from his hometown in a political conspiracy that prevented him from ascending to the throne. Even so, he decided to recruit all of those who agreed to fight for him, whether they were farmers, thieves, or vagabonds. Vercingetorix, already with some fame, returned to his former city and regained the right to the throne. With his status restored, he began to send emissaries to the chiefs of other tribes, asking for help in fighting Rome. After establishing some alliances, Vercingetorix and his commanders began to train the Celts according to Roman discipline, creating an army as never before seen among the Celtic peoples. Vercingetorix knew that his greatest advantage against the legions was a large and organized cavalry. When Julius Caesar learned of the formation of this army, he organized a military expedition to fight the Celtic rebels. The Romans went all over Gaul, demanding loyalty from various Celtic leaders. This demand was based on more promises and threats. Thus, many tribal chiefs did not support Vercingetorix. Battles were fought, mainly between Roman and Celtic cavalries, with the former almost always winning. Vercingetorix was forced to retreat, but in his escape through Gaulish territory, he decided to use scorched earth tactics, a strategy of burning villages, towns, and farms, not allowing the enemy army to seize anything. After losing the city of Bourges, Vercingetorix was forced to flee with what was left of his troops. With his army already greatly reduced, Vercingetorix continued to send emissaries, asking for military support from Celtic chieftains, even those who had already sworn allegiance to Rome. Finally, Vercingetorix was forced to take refuge in the city of Alesia, a great defensive point since it was built on a hill. What followed was one of the saddest and most shameful chapters in Celtic history. In September 52 BC, Alesia was besieged by Julius Caesar. The Romans built two wooden walls around the city, one to keep Vercingetorix and his men imprisoned, the other to repel the Celtic army, which was approaching to rescue the citizens of Alesia. The siege itself was relatively normal. The Romans cut off water and food supplies in the city, forcing the inhabitants to starve and thirst. Even as many did, the brave Celts refused to surrender, waiting to be saved by an army of their countrymen. This army did emerge, but was unable to defeat or push the Romans back, who had already established a strong defensive position. After this defeat, the morale of those inside the city was destroyed. Realizing that there would be no further rescue attempts, they were overcome by despair. Other Celtic leaders refused to send troops to help Vercingetorix, fearing the revenge of the Romans. With no other way out and trying to save the rest of the survivors of Alesia, Vercingetorix surrendered. Vercingetorix's surrender was an iconic moment, being depicted in many classical paintings. According to the French historian Augustine Thierry, Vercingetorix rode proudly to the Roman camp, stopped in front of the powerful Roman general without saying a word, and threw his weapons disdainfully at Caesar's feet. 
Vercingetorix's courage and dedication in fighting for his people eventually cost him dearly. He was stripped, imprisoned, transported to Rome, and incarcerated in a small cell, where he lived in humiliation for six years. After six long years, Vercingetorix was taken from his cell and forced to walk through the streets of Rome tied to Julius Caesar's carriage in a ceremony known as the Triumph, whose purpose was to extol the achievements of Roman generals in foreign campaigns. After the ceremony, Vercingetorix was taken back to his cell, where he was strangled by Roman soldiers on orders from Julius Caesar. At the site of the former city of Alicia, there is a statue in honor of Vercingetorix and the resistance of the Celtic people. The Celtic's fight against Rome was more than just a few battles for territories, it was a fight for freedom. Vercingetorix's surrender marked the end of the Celts' resistance against Rome. But the Celts and their culture endured. Many learned to live and prosper under Rome. The fame of Celtic warriors spread throughout Europe and beyond. Many warriors were mercenaries in Greece, Egypt, Anatolia, and the Roman army itself. With the arrival of Christianity, Celtic culture gradually dissolved. On the one hand, this happened due to the assimilation of the new religion, but the Celtic culture was also being assimilated. However, the courage and perseverance of the Celtic peoples will forever be recorded in history.